This lecture is part of Berkeley Math 115, um, an introductory course on number theory for undergraduates. Um, this lecture is on binomial coefficients. Um, the first part of it um, gave some a review of some basic properties of binomial coefficients. So this is the second part of the lecture where I'll be discussing some number theoretic properties of binomial coefficients. So first of all, we're going to look at binomial coefficients um, modulo 2. This means um, what we do is we just write out Pascal's triangle like this, except whenever we get an even number, I put 0, and whenever we get an odd number, I put 1. So I'm putting 0 instead of 2 here, because 1 plus 1 is even. Um, and we can go on like this. And um, now here we see we've got a 1 at each end of the line and a lot of zeros in the middle. And this means that um, the, the, the one here is now giving another copy of this little bit of Pascal's triangle, so it sort of looks like this. And then we get one, 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 and then we suddenly get almost all zeros again. And what I want to do is to look at the pattern the zeros are making. So here we have a sort of triangle of zeros, and here we have a triangle of zeros, except it's a rather small triangle because there's only one zero in it. And what's going to happen here? Well, here we're going to get another huge triangle of zeros because whenever we've got a row of zeros, we, 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 er, 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 everything below it in this triangle just has to be zero. So there's a lot of zeros. And, and here we've got a one with lots of zeros. So below this one, we're going to get another copy of this triangle here. So if I, if I sort of um, draw this triangle here, then what's going to happen is we're going to get another copy of it down here and another copy of it down here. And in particular, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a whole line of ones at the bottom um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And now, since I've got a whole line of 1s, I again get a whole line of zeros everywhere except for a 1 at the end. So we're sometimes getting these rows where everything is 0, and you can see it's going to kind of repeat like this in a sort of vaguely fractal-like pattern. Um, so here, this is... You remember we have to count rows in a funny way. So this is row 0, and this is row 1, and this is row 2. 2, and this is row 4, and this is row 8, and this is row 16. Now you notice these are just powers of 2. So whenever the row is a power of 2, almost all the coefficients are vanishing. So, so what this is saying is that nk is equal to naught if n is 2 to the power of something, and naught is less than k is less than n. So we've, we've got this funny property that every now and then almost all the entries of a row vanish. Um, well, that works for two. Um, we see that sometimes almost all entries of a row are divisible by two. And we can ask if the same thing happens for other primes. So, so let's sort of try three. So here we have one, 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 two, one, one, zero, zero, one, because here I'm now going to write 0 if something's divisible by 3. And you see this is row 3, and almost everything is divisible by 3. And in fact, the same thing happens for any prime. So if p is prime, we can look at the binomial coefficients p choose k, and we see this is 0 if 0 is less than k is less than p. Obviously, p0 is equal to pk is equal to 1, so these are not divisible. Sorry, pp is equal to 1, so these are not divisible by, by p. And we can prove this in several ways. Well, one way is to use the explicit formula for binomial coefficients. So this is equal to p factorial times k factorial times p minus k factorial. And if we stare at this, we see that this is divisible by p. Um, because it's, you know, it's got an ob obvious factor of feet, p. And this, these terms here are not divisible by p unless... Well, the first term is divisible by p if k is equal to p, and the second term is divisible by p if k is equal to 0. 
So as long as um, k is not equal to p or 0, that the, the factor of p in the numerator won't cancel out with anything in the denominator. So this is divisible by p if 0 is less than k less than p. So this will be very useful a little bit later when we will use it to give one of the proofs of Fermat's theorem. Um, so th th this is a sort of funny application. It means that if we take x plus y to the p, this is equal to x to the p plus y to the p plus something times p. So for example, if we look at x plus y to the 5, this is equal to x to the 5 plus y to the 5 plus, and now we've got 5 times x to the 4y, sorry, uh, to put the 5 outside the bracket, 5 times x to the 4y plus 2x cubed y squared plus 2x squared y cubed plus xy to the 4. Um, so if you ignore multiples of 5, we have the nice formula that x plus y to the 5 is equal to x to the 5 plus y to the 5. Um, well, when we did mod 2, we saw that everything vanished not only on the second row, but also on the fourth row and on the eighth row and on the sixteenth row. And you can guess the same thing happens for all primes. So suppose we take a power of a prime and look at k. Um, we think this should be divisible by p if naught is less than k is less than p to the n. So let's put a question mark because we want to think about whether this is true. Well, one way of proving it is, is to use this fact about x plus y to the p being almost divisible by p. So we know x plus y to the p is equal to x to the p plus y to the p plus p times some sort of junk. Well, what about x plus y to the p squared? Well, this is equal to x plus y to the p to the power of p. And this will be x to the p plus y to the p plus p times something, all to the power of p, and this will be x to the p squared plus y to the p squared plus p times something very, very complicated because we've got all these p's here and we've got more p times something coming from this. But whatever, we, we, we still see that x plus y to the p squared is x to the p squared plus y to the p squared if you ignore multiples of p. So this just says that p squared k is equal to naught if naught is less than k is less than p squared. And we can do the same thing and show that the same thing happens for x plus y to the p cubed and so on and just carry on like this. So we see that binomial coefficients are sometimes divisible by p uh, uh, at special values of, of, of the numerator. So, so, so this is indeed correct. Um, it's quite often useful to know exactly how many times a prime divides a binomial coefficient. So, for, for, for example, we might want to um, know how many times 2 divides, say, the binomial coefficient 100 choose 50 or something like that. Well, you remember binomial coefficients are n factorial over k factorial times n minus k factorial. So we want to know how many times a prime divides, say, n factorial. For instance, if we take, say, 8 factorial, um, let's try and figure out how many times 2 divides it. Well, this is 2 times 3 times 4 times 5 times 6 times 7 times 8. And you notice there are 1, 2, 3, 4 even numbers. And each of them gives a factor of 2 dividing 8 factorial. So 2 divides 8 factorial at least 4 times. Um, but that doesn't give us the right answer because we notice that this is not only divisible by 2, it's actually divisible by 2 squared. So we, we should add some more multiples of this. So here I've got, these are all divisible by 2 squared. So I should um, um, add an extra factor of 2 coming from this and an extra factor of 2 coming from this. So we get an extra factor of 2 squared. And finally, the number 8 is actually divisible by 2 cubed. So we get yet another power of 2 dividing it. So we have an extra power of 2 to the 1. So altogether, 
we get 2 to the 4 times 2 squared times 2 to the 1, which is 2 to the 7, dividing this. N notice, by the way, the 2 cubed is the total number of 2s dividing 8, but I've already counted two of them, one of them here and one of them here, so I only count one extra one here, not, not, not three of them. So 2 to the 7 is the biggest power of 2 um, dividing 8. Um, and in general, if we want to know how many times does p divide n factorial, let's do it. We write all the numbers 1, 2, up to n. And then some of these will be divisible by p. So we get p and 2p and so on. So how many are going to be divisible by p? Well, we get p divides... Well, you might think it's n over p, but in fact we take the integer part of this. So, so we sometimes put square brackets around things when we say take the integer part. So that will be the, 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 the number of numbers below uh, n that are divisible by p. But then we've got to add extra numbers for all the factors of p squared. And there are this number with p squared divides something. And then we do the same for p cubed, of course, so we get the fractional part of n over p cubed, and so on. So the number of times p divides n is going to be n over p, except we take the integer part, plus n over p squared, except we take the integer part, plus n over p cubed, except we take the integer part. And this sum is actually finite, because as soon as p to the n is, p to the k is bigger than n, um, this term will be zero. You notice this is slightly less than the um, than the geometric series, and so on. In fact, it's strictly less than that, which is sort of n over p minus one. So this gives a reasonable rough estimate for the number of times p divides n. So let's just do a couple of examples. Let's take a um, thousand factorial and ask how many zeros. At, or at the end of it, if you write it out in decimal. Well, obviously, we need to work out how many times does 5 divide this and how many times does 2 divide this. So um, 5 divides this. Well, the number of times 5 divides it is 1,000 over 5. Let me take the integer part of this, which is 200. And then we take 1,000 over 5 squared and take the integer part of it. But we can more easily just take 200 over 5 and take the integer part of that, which is 40. And we take 40 over 5, take the integer part of that, which is 8. Take 8 over 5, and the integer part of that is 1. And we take 1 over 5, and the integer part of that is 0. So we stop. So we add up all these numbers, we get 249. So so 5 divides 1,000 factorial exactly 249 times. And what about 2? Well, we should take 1,000 over 2, which is 500, and then 500 over 2, which is 250. And this is going to go on a bit, but it's a bit pointless because we can see that this is going to be obviously bigger than the number of times 5 divides it. I mean, we've already got more than 249. So we see 1,000 factorial ends in exactly 249 zeros. Um, and we can use this to work out number of times primes divide binomial coefficients um, in much the same way. For example, let's work out the power of 7 dividing 1,000, so 100 choose 40 for no particular reason. And all we do is, is we do the following calculation. We work at the number of sevens in, inside 100, where we divide 100 by 7. And this is going to be a little bit more than 14. Then we divide 14 over 7. And this is going to be 2. So we've got 16 sevens dividing 100 factorial. And then we do the same thing with 40. So 40 over 7. This integer part is about 5. And 5 um, is obviously less than 7, so we can stop there and we just get 5 of these. And then we do 60 over 7 is about 8, and 8 over 7 is about 1, and so altogether we get 9 there. So um, um, we get 16 7s dividing 100 factorial, we subtract the 1s dividing 40 factorial, and subtract the 1s dividing 60 factorial, um, and 
um, this just gives us 2. So this is divisible by um, 2 powers of the prime 7. Um, um, now, for later uh, use this lecture, it would be useful to know roughly how big our binomial coefficients n choose k. And we can give a very crude estimate, which will be good enough for many purposes. Um, the first crude estimate is that n choose k is at most 2 to the n. And that's because the sum of the nth row is 2 to the n, as we showed in the previous video. And obviously, if the sum of them is 2 to the n, then each individual term is 2 to the n. Well, obviously, the terms are going to be a somewhat smaller than that in general. Um, and we might want a lower bound. So, well, in general, um, you know, the lower bound is going to be 1, because some of them are 1. But we can ask for a lower bound for, say, the middle coefficient. And we notice the middle coefficient is going to be at least 2 to the n over n plus 1. And that's because 2 to the n is the sum of n plus 1 coefficients, 2n choose 0, 2n choose 1, and so on. And there are, sorry, and that should be 2n plus 1, of course. And, um, sorry, 2 to the 2, and I forgot I'd changed n to a 2. So, so um, 2 to the 2n is the sum of these 2n plus 1 coefficients, and um, there are, since there are 2n plus 1 of these, the middle one is, uh, the, 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 the average of them must be at most 2 to the 2n over 2n plus 1, and notice that this is the biggest coefficient. So the biggest of these 2n plus 1 coefficients must be at least the average size of them. So, um, so we know that this term is um, at least this, and it's at most 2 to the 2n, so we sort of pinned it down to within a factor of about 2n plus 1, which for some purposes is good enough. Um, if we want to be more precise, um, we, can, we can do much better by using um, Stirling's formula. Stirling gave a, a formula for n factorial, which says that n factorial is approximately equal to n to the n plus a half times e to the minus n times root 2 pi. Heaven knows where that root 2 pi comes from. Um, um, well, we're not actually going to use this um, because we're only going to be doing some rather rough estimates. But if you, if you do need to know binomial coefficients more precisely, you can get them like this, again, by writing binomial coefficients in terms of factorials, and then use, applying Stirling's formula to the factorials. If you want to be even more precise than this, then there's an extension of Stirling's formula, which, which, which gives you um, an even more accurate form of the error term. So we have pretty good control over, over the size of factorials and binomial coefficients if we need it. Um, so now I'm going to give an application of this to the following problem. We want to say how many primes are there less than or equal to a number n? And the prime number theorem says that there are uh, the number of primes less than n is approximately n over log of n. Uh, more precisely, it says that the ratio of the number of primes less than n divided by this number tends to 1 as n tends to infinity. And the prime number theorem is rather difficult to prove. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sketch how to use binomial coefficients to prove a slightly weaker form of it. So, so here's a sort of weak form. Instead of saying that... Um, Let's see, this is pi of n for the number of primes less than n. So, so I'm going to denote this by pi of n. So instead of showing that pi of n is a close to n over log of n, I'm going to say if we take a half of n over log of n, this is going to be less than or equal to pi of n is less than or equal to 2n over log of n. So we're sort of getting this bound within a factor of about 2. Um, and um, now I'll show how to do this. Um, well, first of all, 
let, let's try and do the upper bound. So let's try and find an upper bound for pi of n. I'm not going to give full details of these upper bound and lower bound because it becomes a little bit fiddly to get them right, but I'll, I'll give the main ideas and th th this should be enough for you to fill in details if, if you want to. So the key idea for both the upper bound and the lower bound is to look at the binomial coefficient 2nn and to look at the primes dividing it. So um, in the first, in the in the earlier part of this lecture, I showed that we've got re very good control over primes dividing binomial coefficients, and we've also got some rough control over the size of this. And by combining these two facts, we can get some reasonable control over over numbers of primes. So first of all, we notice that suppose n is less than a prime p is less than 2n. Then p divides 2n n exactly once. That's because if we look at 2n factorial over n factorial times n factorial, we see that p divides this and it does not divide this because um, it's bigger than n. So, um, so we find the product of all primes between n and 2n of p is less than or equal to 2n choose n. So this means product of all primes, primes p between n and 2n. The, the convention in number theory is whenever you write down p, it's, it's usually understood to be a prime. So when you write down an expression like this, the convention is it's understood you're taking a product over just primes p. Um, yeah, uh, this notation is a bit ambiguous, but you get used to it. And we know an upper bound for this. This is at most 2 to the 2n by what we just said. And this gives us a, a, a nice upper bound for the number of primes. So let's take the logarithms. So we have the sum over n is less than p is less than 2n of log of p is at most log of 2 to the 2n, which is 2n times the log of 2. And we also notice that this bit here is greater than or equal to um, log of n times the number of primes for in the interval from n to 2n. So now this gives us an estimate for the number of primes between n and 2n. So we find the number of primes from n to 2n is at most 2 log 2 times n divided by log of n. And that's very nice because we've got this n over log of n. Well, I guess it should be 2n over log of 2n really, but um, so this is, you know, so this is going to be approximately log of 2 times 2n over log of 2n. Yes, I know log of 2n is not actually equal to log of n, but they're actually pretty close because this is just log of n plus log of 2. So these are approximately equal to that. So now we can, we can um, find the number of primes less than or equal to n is bounded by about two, sorry, yeah, yeah, two times n over log of n. And the way we get this is we divide the interval from um, zero to n into the interval from n over two to n, and the interval from n over four to n over two, and the interval from n over eight to n over four, and so on. And on this interval, we can obtain a bound for the number of primes because we've got one here. And on this interval, we can sort of obtain a bound for the number of primes. Well, except that n over 2 might not quite be an integer, but so, so there's a little bit of fiddling going on there. Um, anyway, we, we've got nice estimates for the number of primes in each of these intervals, and we can add them up and get, give an estimate for the number of primes from 0 to n. And as I said, if we do the estimate a little bit more carefully, we find we actually find the bound for the primes less than or equal to n is 2n over log of n. 
Um, there's nothing special about this number two. If you work very hard, you can actually make this number two a little bit smaller, but it seems to be very difficult to make it arbitrarily close to one, which would give you the upper bound for the prime number theorem. So, so these very elementary ideas using binomial coefficients can get within a factor of, you know, about two or maybe 1.5 of the prime number theorem, but they, it's, it's very difficult to get all the way there. So um, that's given us an upper bound for the number of primes. Um, now let's try and find a lower bound for the number of primes less than or equal to n. Um, and for this, um, we're going to again look at the binomial coefficient 2n choose n and, and again look at the primes um, dividing it. And what we notice is that the product over p to the k is less than 2n, less than or equal to 2n of p, is greater than or equal to 2n choose n. So here we're taking a product over all prime powers, and um, we're, we're only taking a product of the prime. Um, so I think that should be that, that should be 2 times n, not 2 to the power of n. And what we do is we, we need to count up the number of times p divides 2n choose n. And we remember we found a formula for the number of times p divides 2n choose n. We take 2n p and we take the integer part of it and then we subtract the integer part of n p and we subtract the integer part of n p again. And we do the same thing for prime powers. So that should be an n. And we do the same thing for prime cubes and so on. And now we look at this expression here and we see that this term here is either 1 or 0. And the reason for this is that if we take any number x, then xp, 2xp minus uh, xp minus xp is always going to be 1 or 0. And we may as well divide x by p. So we're looking at a number, the integer part of 2x minus the integer part of x minus the integer part of x. And this is obviously either 1 or 0 because it just depends on whether the fractional part of x is between 0 and a half or between a half and 1. And similarly, all these terms here are either 1 or 0. So, um, so um, what, what we're going to get is um, a product um, over, um, for, for each prime p to the k, that's, for each prime power p to the k that's at most 2n, we're going to get at most one factor of p dividing 2nk. So if we take all powers of p to the k less than or equal to 2n and multiply them, that's sort of making all these terms equal to 1, which will make this product big, uh, bigger. So, so this product here is at least 2n over k. And now you see we've got a sort of lower bound for the number of primes, or rather the product of all the primes. And now we've got to kind of turn this into account for the number of primes. Well, first of all, we need to know what 2nn is, and this is greater than or equal to 2n, sorry, 2 to the power of 2n over 2n plus 1. Now what we're going to do is to take logarithms of both sides. So we take the sum over p to the k is less than or equal to 2n of log of p is greater than or equal to log of 2 to the 2n divided by 2n plus 1 which is equal to 2n log of 2 minus log of 2n plus 1. And now how do we get from that to counting primes? Well, we need to make several simplifying assumptions. First of all, we, 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 the, the, the terms with p squared, p cubed, and so on are small. So. Um, that's because squares and cubes and so on are pretty rare. So we can sort of ignore squares and cubes and primes because that won't make a big difference. The second thing to observe is that the function log of x is constant. 
Well, of course, it's not constant. It's almost constant. Um, and if you've seen graphs of log of x in calculus, you, you, you sort of see the graph is drawn something like this. And it sure doesn't look constant. But that's because you haven't looked at it on a big enough scale. If you, if you um, zoom out, so say you go up to a billion here, then the graph of log of x looks like this. It's completely indistinguishable from the x axis because it's so close and then it sort of shoots off down here. So, so it just looks like a right angled bend. Um, well that's if the y axis is on the same scale as the x axis. If we want to see a little bit more precisely what log of x does, what we do is we rescale the y axis. So maybe um, we only go up to 100 here and a, a few hundred million or a billion then. If we do that, the graph of log of x now sort of looks like this. And then just before the zero, it turns down. And what you notice is that this is very nearly constant. Um, that's because if we go from here to here, we're going down by a factor of e, say. So log of x just goes down by 1. So if this was about 20 or whatever, that would go down to about 19 here. So, so most of this is constant. So if, if we look at this, we, we find that this log of p here is very close to being log of 2n for most primes. Um, so, so let's put all these together. Um, what we then find is that the sum over p is less than or equal to 2n. So now I'm just looking at summing over primes and missing out prime powers of log of 2n is approximately bigger than or equal to 2n times log of 2. Here I'm missing out this term log of 2n plus 1 because that's, that's much smaller than 2n times log of 2. So this says the number of primes less than or equal to 2n is greater than or equal to 2n log of 2 divided by log of 2n minus some small fudge factors. So you remember there are about three places where I threw away small terms because I found them rather boring. And if you want a really precise result, you really need to keep track of this. But what we notice is that this is really just a constant times n times 2n over log of 2n minus some small bits there. So that is giving us a lower bound for the number of primes less than or equal to 2n, which is pretty close to 2n divided by log of 2n. So we found that the number of primes less than 2n lies between about 2n over log of 2n times a half and 2 times um, 2n over log of 2n. So we've sort of proved the prime number theorem up to a factor of 2, um, except that we kind of skimped over a few of the somewhat more technical details. Um, so um, there's one um, final um, application of number theory and binomial coefficients I wanted to mention, which is um, I'm again going to look at these numbers 2n choose 2, 2n choose n. The, 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 the middle binomial coefficients. And if you, if you write these out, you get think the, these numbers 1, 2, 6, 20, 70, and so on. And now you may notice these are divisible by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And in fact, if you continue a bit more, you find this continues. The, 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 the binomial coefficient 2n choose n is divisible by um, n plus 1. And let's divide it by n plus 1 and see what we get. We get the, the sequence 1, 1, 2, um, 5, 14, um, and so on. And this is a very famous sequence called the Catalan numbers. So I want to say a little bit more about the Catalan numbers and explain why they're integers. 
Well, the reason the Catalan numbers are integers is they count various things. Um, they actually count a rather astonishingly large number of things. So I'll, I'll just give one or two examples. Um, the simplest way is they count ways to bracket a product. So how can I work out a product of one thing A? Well, there's only one thing to do there. I can just multiply it by itself. How about if I want to multiply A, B, A times B? Well, there's only one way to do that. Just multiply A by B. What happens if I want A, B, C? Well, I can first multiply A by B and get C, or I can multiply B and C together and then get A. So there are two ways of doing that. And how many ways are there to multiply four things? Well, I can take A times B times C times D, or I can take um, A times B times C times D, where I first multiply C by D and then continue like that, or I can do A times B and then multiply C by D and then multiply these together, or I can do um, B times C and then times A and then times D, or I can do B times C times D and then multiply by A. And if you see, there are five different ways to um, do that. And if you were very patient, you could do what happens if you take a product of five things, and you would find there are 14 different ways to multiply them together. So, um, so um, if you define Catalan numbers by this formula, but by counting these things, they're obviously integers. And the problem is, why is this number equal to the binomial coefficient here divided by n plus 1? And I'll give a sort of sketch of why this is true. If we denote the Catalan numbers by Cn, um, we know C0 equals 1. And Cn is equal to C0 Cn minus 1 plus C1 Cn minus 2 and so on, all the way up to plus Cn minus 1 C0. And that's because if we want to multiply n things together, a, b, c, d, up to something, so if we want to multiply them together, what we can do is first of all take a, and then we multiply this by some product of b up to the others. Or we can take a times b times something else, or we can multiply um, a, b, c, and there are c two ways of multiplying these, and then we multiply all, all the rest of these together, and that th there are going to be c n minus three ways of bracketing those, and so on. So, so we get this formula for the number of ways of multiplying n things together by by by, by just counting by, by by just counting over the the, the, the first two blocks we divide things into and then then applying the Catalan numbers to each of these. So um, so how do we identify the Catalan numbers from this funny formula? Well, um, th th there's a very neat way of doing this, which is to use generating functions. So this is a very powerful tool. What we do is we define a function f of x to be c0 plus c1x plus c2x squared and so on. And this formula here means that um, if we take f of x squared, this is just going to be um, c0 squared plus c1 c0 plus c0 c1 x plus c0 c2 plus c1 c1 plus c2 c0 x squared and so on. And you see these numbers here are just the numbers appearing here. So this expression here is almost the same as f of x, except we have to shift by 1. So um, what we find is that, in fact, 1 plus f of x squared is equal to f of x. It's because we have to shift by 1, because this isn't c0, this is c1, and this is c2, and so on. We've got to put this 1 in here because um, we, we when we multiply by, by, sorry, I forgot to put in that factor of x. When we multiply by x, we, we need to add in the constant term. So here we have a formula for f, and this is just a quadratic equation, which we can solve using the formula for a quadratic equation. This is equal to 1 minus root of 1 minus 4x divided by 2x. So all we have to do is to work out what this function is and its coefficients of the Catalan numbers. And we can do this as follows. So you remember um, 1 plus x to the n is equal to 1 plus n choose 
1 x plus n choose 2 x squared and so on all the way up to plus n choose n x to the n and it turns out the same is true even if n is not an integer this is um, Newton's formula um, you just find 1 plus x to the power of let me write it as a so it doesn't look so much like an integer this is just equal to n a choose 0 plus a choose 1 x plus a choose 2 x squared and this just goes on forever in particular we find 1 plus x to the half which is the square root of 1 plus x can be written as 1 plus a half x plus a half times minus a half over 2 factorial times x squared plus a half times minus a half times minus 3 over 2 over 3 factorial times x cubed plus a half times minus a half times minus 3 over 2 times minus 5 over 2 over 4 factorial times x 4 and so on. And these expressions here look a little bit messy, but in fact there's an easy way to write them out. So for, that, that's because if we take 1 times 3 times 5, we can write this as 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5 times 6 divided by 2 times 1 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 3, which is 6 factorial over 2 cubed times 3 factorial. And similarly, if we take the product of the first um, few odd numbers, we can write it in terms of factorials using this trick. Um, so doing this, we see that the expression for 1 plus x to the half can actually be written, that the coefficients can be written in terms of factorials. And um, if we um, look at the expression for f of x, we find we've got the square root of 1 plus something there. So if we do this, we find f of x, which was equal to 1 minus the square root of 1 minus 4x over 2x, turns out to be the sum of 2n minus 2 factorial over n factorial n minus 1 factorial times x to the n minus 1, which is the sum over x to the n of 2nn um, divided by n plus 1. And these coefficients here are just the Catalan numbers. And um, since the Catalan numbers are integers, we see that n plus 1 divides 2n choose n. OK, well, I said the Catalan numbers also turn up in several other ways. They, they not only count the number of ways of multiplying n things, but they also count various sorts of binary trees, and they also count various ways of subdividing polygons. And if you want to see all the ways, you can get this rather nice book by Richard Stanley, where he lists all the different ways of defining Catalan numbers. So um, here are the first few. They're, they're ways of cutting up a polygon into triangles. There are various ways for trees. And how long does this go on for? Well, it, it goes on for many pages. And he has found 214 um, different sorts of sets that are counted by Catalan numbers. And um, doubtless there have been a few more found since then. So, so Catalan numbers really do turn up rather often. Okay, that will be all for this lecture.